Yes is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. It's hard to believe we're in the middle of spring starting and we had nine inches of snow dumped in Denver, Colorado this morning. So that's how we started our day. But the good news is about Colorado is it may be here an hour ago and it will be gone, which is we're seeing the melt happen. And my guest today will melt the rest of it away because he's one of my very favorite people. A little bit about Dan Pointer is that he has written a gazillion books. He's published well in excess of a hundred of them. He's been an extraordinarily successful publisher in his own right. And he's, if, if I was thinking uh, one word that would describe Dan, it would be evangelist. He's an evangelist for authors. He's an evangelist about books. And he's an evangelist about selling books outside of bookstores and learning how to do it on your own. So with that, let's welcome Dan. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm doing great, Judith. How are you today? I'm fabulous. And, you know, we're looking forward to having you here in uh, snowy Colorado right now. Yes. <laughs> um, Dan will be one of our key speakers at the Author You Extravaganza, May 1 through 3. So if you would like to schmooze with him, meet him, get his incredible in-depth and savvy insight, you want to be here, too. And Dan is going to be talking about really some areas of, of really marketing and targeting your own market of where you need to go um, and using the Internet as your deep dive pal. Um, so that's it. And that's not the name of his talk, but I think that's one of the, some of the things that he's going to be covering. Am I correct, Dan? That's right. This is going to be fun because it's my favorite subject. Uh, which, which part? <laughs> which, which, which part? Well, I like... You know, I love, I really love writing books, and um, and that's so easy today. Um, but um, the promotion is is the great challenge, and I don't know why it is, but I I came from a different area, and I didn't come from the book trade, so I wasn't um, you know reined in by the book trade, and I didn't do things the way the book trade does, and uh, I just did things differently, which turns out to be the very best way. And the big New York publishers still don't get it; they're still sending books out to bookstores. And uh, the so-called traditional outlets, and I've always gone after the, well, what they call the non-traditional outlets. Well, I, you know, I have to say my success has not been with the traditional outlets either. That um, when I look at my gross book sales for my, and I've only, I, I have, my books don't match the number of year, I'm only at 31. But when I look at my gross book sales in relationship to what I did with New York and 18 of my books have been published with New York, that they um, diminish in, in gross sales and they, they are minuscule in revenues. Well, and, yeah. Sure, you do it yourself, you make more money, you get the press sooner and you keep control of the product. I mean, what could be better than that? And, uh, uh, and still, there's just so many people who don't get that and... Um, I, I think now the New York publishers are probably feeling threatened by it. Well, I think that part of that is a snob factor. I, I mean, I had a discussion with an author just the other day, and he really does want to sell it to New York because of his clientele that will have more of a credibility. And I said, ah, so that's the snob factor that they, they adhere to. And he says, no, you're right. I get that. It's ridiculous. And the thing is, he doesn't need the money. It's doing it for positioning. But that it's amazing that there's so many that still think that if you have a New York imprint, it guarantees sales, and it does not. Well, answer this question. Have you ever heard anybody say, Random House, I love their books, I buy all of them? Right. Of course exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's no branding. There's, there's one brand in books, maybe one and a half brands. One brand are the dummies books, 
because if you bought a dummy's book on this subject, you might buy a dummy's book on a different subject when you have your interest change. Another sort of a brand was chicken soup books. Other than that, there are no brands. People do not buy books by publisher. They buy them by author, whether that's fiction or it's nonfiction. They, they go with somebody, an expert that they recognize. So uh, what, what's the advantage of uh, you know, selling out to a publisher? Uh, you're going to make less money. It takes them 18 months to get your book into print, and then they go and change your title. Um, or what's it's been about five years now, and uh, many of the most of the big publishers have switched over to using natural stock paper. Well, natural means it looks like newsprint. It's cheap paper. Yes, it's and, very cheap. Uh, I purchased books uh, from Amazon, sight unseen, got them in, opened them up, put them down, and have never read them just because they don't look credible. And that's one of the advantages of being a a self-publisher, a small publisher, is that you can maintain the quality, which costs you three or four cents more. And and then if your book is on the shelf, whether it be a virtual or an actual shelf, um, next to other books on the same subject, people are going to pick up those books and they're going to put the others aside and they're going to select your book just because it looks more credible. I, I think quality is critical really critical um, on what you have to have and and and, and, the, and quality is not only how the visually books looks but also how they feel and um, I know Dan you have been a huge proponent and we also need to mention uh, you have a something that you created the the eGlobal book awards that the entry fees um, end this month for the next competition. So mm-hmm. why don't you mention that very quickly so for our listeners they know about what's going on there. Well, we have the Global eBook Awards. The reason we established them was that we want to help uh, publicize and promote eBooks. Uh, eBooks are the future. We're on the leading edge. Uh, we can see where things. We can see the handwriting on the screen. Uh, we know what's going to happen, and we want to be part of it, and we want to help other people who have eBooks. So yeah, the it, the uh, entry closes at midnight the last day of April. And um, another thing is that we have uh, uh, more than 200 reviewers who uh, review those books in their own particular category. They re- review the books of their choice. And we send out seven uh, promotional programs or ideas or assignments to people to help them promote their ebooks. So we're teaching them promotion of their ebooks as we're uh, evaluating them and uh, making awards. Which is what they need to do. Now, Dan, are you just strictly for um, uh, the regular ebook? Or are you getting into the, the, like the fix for the tablets or something in the iBook store? Do you take them all? No, no, we take them all. Yeah. Okay. So there far, you go. we're taking them in two languages and we're going to expand to other languages next year. Well, that's pretty exciting. So, how many people entered? Do you expect to enter this year? Well, I, I'd like to tell you a thousand, but we're not quite to that number yet. <laughs> well, I, you know what? I've been putting it out, so I've been trying to help. <laughs> well, yeah, I tell you, it's, it's, entering your book in a, for a book award, it takes a little work. I mean, it takes some time out of your day. And you've got to get get all the pieces together and send things off, and and um, it's it's not just uh, you know cl- clicking on something and you're in because uh, well you've got to get all the information together and I think that's what holds people up. Mm-hmm. Well, that's terrific. All right. So, uh, let's um the ebooks so you had said, I know mean, I think that I don't know if you're still saying it because I always countered you when you said it that you thought ebooks were going to take over and basically at least that was my interpretation and I could be wrong um that ebooks were going to take over and that you would um uh, basically print would disappear. And, I, and the consensus, I, I had a, a fun discussion with Mark Coker from Smashwords, and he really feels that print is definitely here to stay, and they are going to happily coexist. Well, uh, print is here to stay. I mean, uh, television didn't replace radio, and when the uh, Xerox copier came along, that didn't eliminate books. Uh, we'll always have the printed book, but some of those are going to be books as an art form, coffee table books, and some are going to be uh, the multi multi bestseller is probably mostly fiction uh-huh. and, That's right. uh, we'll, so we'll always have some of those but you just can't argue with economics you can say oh I like the look and feel of the book I like the smell of the paper or whatever that's all fine but you can't argue with the economics and it's so much cheaper to put out an ebook uh, 
There's no printing. There's no trucking. Trucking prices are just out of sight. For me to ship a self-publishing manual across the country um, in by the pallet, I mean in, by mm-hmm. the truckload, um, they cost it costs more than fifty cents per book. Mm-hmm. I mean that's just incredible. And I certainly don't have them printed in Michigan and shipped out here to store them and ship back to my distributor NBN. Uh, that'd be a dollar a book. I mean mm-hmm. there wouldn't be any profit left in this thing. So um, uh, people get their ebook faster, easier, cheaper than they can the printed book, and uh, uh, and it's, it's so it's so much easier for us because we don't have any licking, sticking, sorting, tacking, posting. Uh, it's all done electronically. We don't even have to do the um, uh, what do call it the um, accounting for it. Uh, you know, we we log those ebooks in as sold once a month. Uh, we don't have to log in each one of them. So mm-hmm. it's faster, easier, cheaper. Uh, it's better for the, the reader gets it at the speed of light, not next week sometime. Um, we're not irritating a bunch of postal workers. Uh, they, that can be dangerous. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just, it, no matter how you look at it, it it's superior. Uh, you know, I like to, but I have a number of print books here that are stacked up that I'll probably never get to. But um, Christmas two years ago, I uh, was home for a couple of weeks, and it was very unusual because I fly a lot. You know, I'm on the road 6,000 mm-hmm. miles a week. Mm-hmm. And um, and so it gave me a chance to read one of these books. And I started reading it, and I said, how awkward. I have to hold this book with two hands. I can hold my iPhone with one hand. And then after a while, I thought, I need to look up this word. Oh, I've got to get out of bed and go find a dictionary. <laughs> this is oh, oh, poor, oh, poor Dan. Oh, poor Dan. Oh, iPhone, I could just just tap on it and I get the definition of the word. Yeah. And um, you know, then the another thing was, oh, for this print book, I have to turn on the light to read it. I don't have to do that with my iPhone because it's it's backlighted. And All right. So well, so- I heard, yeah, there's there's pluses and minus. You're talking to a print person. Um, okay. I don't I, I don't want to be on. I, I'm on so much electronics. I need to get off it. But we're going to come right back um, in just a few seconds. We're with Dan Pointer. I'm Judith Bryles. You're listening to Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing, and we're talking the wide world of self-publishing today. is your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles and we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the rockstar radio network is there a book in you or another author you will show you how to create develop and publish your book without being good if you already have a book out You'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has possessed punch and panache author you is for you if you're a hobbyist or a casual author it's not join author you today through its website at author follow author you on twitter at author you and on facebook at author you where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily author you where the author goes to become seriously successful picture tells a story and it's a truism that people do judge a book by its cover nick selinger and nz graphics have been in the business of producing superior graphic cover design and interior layout for self-published authors independent and traditional publishers for years he has developed a reputation for Excellent work, fast turnarounds, and best of all, affordable pricing. NZ Graphics also produces 
ebooks, and book marketing materials such as posters, sell sheets, postcards, bookmarks, business cards, logos, and more. Books designed for his clients have won multiple book awards, including Best Book Award by U.S. Book News, multiple Evie Awards from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Indie Book Awards, the San Francisco Book Festival Award, and Freedom Medal Award from Valley Forge. Visit www.nzgraphics.com or call 303-985-4174 for more details about making your book the success it should be. Mention that you are an FOJ, friend of Judith's, and that you heard about NZ Graphics on your guide to book publishing. to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask if you want to write and publish a book if you want to be successful as an author your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask is for you stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics scenarios and strategies on what to do now to get you published so let's get back to the show and here again is your host dr judith briles all right, Dan Pointer is my guest. He's an author of over 100 books. One of his, one that made him famous, maybe I'd like to say infamous because it's more fun, is the self-publishing manual, How to Write, Print, and Sell Your Own Book. And Dan will be one of our speakers at the Author You Extravaganza. And if you are thinking about going, if you have a book in you, if you have a book that's limp, needs some help, we've got it there. And Or if you're an author-to-be, go to authoryou.org. Click on the events and then the extravaganza, and the entire uh, agenda is up. Everything is up, um, and we're actually modifying things on a daily basis right now. But there's, it's, it's going to be fabulous. Dan will be there. John Kramer will be there. Joel Kahn will be there. Amy Collins will be there. Penny Sansaberry will be there. I'll be there. 20-plus authors who are also spectacular speakers and experts will be there. So, Dan, you sent me an email, which I thought was Trey fun, and it, you said you enjoy writing both fiction and nonfiction because research is so fun and easy, and then you went on to say you don't go to the library anymore because the library is at your fingertips with the world's largest library on your desktop. So what, what are you researching these days, and, and what would be uh, – well, let's get into some really hard tips now – for our authors when they are doing research? What should they, they, what are some of the drill downs that they should be looking for? Well, the nice thing is just being able to go online to the world's largest library. You don't have to go downtown, find a parking place, and, and look at material that's old. Um, you know, I tell people that um, you know, all the information that you need is right there on the Internet. You've got to sort through it and see what's, what's good and what's bad, and you have to confirm everything that you find. Um, you know, some people say, uh, oh, can you believe everything at Wikipedia? Well, no, but you can believe 95% of it. I love Wikipedia, and it leads me to a lot of other things. And everything that's listed in Wikipedia is referenced, so you can go to the original uh, document. But um, uh, I, you know, I, I live out here in the country, and uh, it's hard to believe that uh, during World War II, on the 23rd of February, two or three months after Pearl Harbor, a Japanese sub came down the coast here and took about 30 shots into an oil facility, uh, he missed everything. So, uh, bad um, shot. <laughs> you know, bad shot. Too, too bad. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, there used to be a mile and a half from me. I'm up on at 400 feet elevation. I'm looking down the Pacific Ocean, and about a mile and a half out um, on the coast, it, there was a huge oil facility. Uh, there were like seven piers and four derricks on each one. Well, all that's gone now. You couldn't tell there was ever an oil facility there. Uh, but this is a historical place because this is where the Japanese, the only place in the mainland U.S. that the Japanese uh, shelled in World War II. And uh, there's a little sign down there now. But I've done a lot of research on that. And then a couple of days ago, I, uh, well, a while back, I found out that there was a German POW camp five miles up the coast. And so we took a drive up there. And there's nothing left but the water tower. Uh, but uh, there are more than 200 German officers uh, kept in that POW camp up there. And 46 of the 48 states had POW camps with Italians and Germans in them. And uh, they were offered 80 cents a day, which is about 9 or $10 now. 
um, to work in the fields, or up north they worked in the factories. And the, the uh, in places like Ohio, for example, the uh, buses would pick them up in the morning, take them down to the factory to work, pick them up in the afternoon, bring them back, and th- they thought that was a pretty good deal. They were getting paid eight bucks a day, and they had uh, you know clean sheets and three meals and a free room and board, and they weren't at the Russian front. And just you know, people just don't they don't they don't believe it when I tell them these stories. And it, you can find this on the internet. You can go to YouTube and find uh, uh, interviews of people who were there and pictures of, of what, mm-hmm. what went on. It just it's fascinating. And, and I love this because one thing leads to another, and you you find out uh, you know, facts that you didn't know. You find out stories you didn't know. You uh, you run into people who are experts on the subject from all over the world. Uh, right there at the speed of light, right on your desktop. So um, it's just uh, we're so lucky to be authors because we have access to all of this information. I, when I first started off in this business uh, back in the 60s, I lived in Boston, and I would drive downtown to the main public library and uh, go to the reference section where they had the books that couldn't be checked out, but they were really solid books. And I, I knew where I could park in an alley for, for nothing. Um, and there were days when I would uh, go down there and I'd take these books and I'd open them up and I'd take them over to the window, put a rest them on the windowsill, and take pictures. I'd rephotograph the pictures that were in those books. Uh, but uh, today, if you want to know something, you can get the very latest information with Google searches. You can get something that was just uh, discovered and posted yesterday, all up-to-date stuff. Um, I'll tell you a story. On one of my books, I... Um, a couple of years ago, I, I wrote the book, and it was 145 pages, and I thought, my God, I didn't do Google Alerts. Uh, you know, I, I, let me go into Google Alerts and add some keywords, and I added the keywords, and over the next five weeks, that p- book grew from 145 pages to 223 pages, all brand new information just from Google Alerts. Um, this is stuff that was just happened, just posted, just written. And uh, made the book you know, much, much better because it was all brand new information. It wasn't yesterday's news. <laughs> um, and so these are some of the things that you have to do in your research is uh, uh, sign up for the Google Alerts. It's free. It's a free clipping service. Um, do the Google searches. And, um, and it's just so much fun to really dig into your subject, get the latest information, uh, meet new people. And, then you're, um, and you also want to look for the blogs on your subject. Uh, on my air travel handbook, I found 123 blogs on air travel from the consumer's point of view, not not flying the airplane and so on, but just consumer air travel, uh, what we call flying commercial. And uh, uh, all these blogs are targeted right at uh, people who are interested in air travel in this particular case. And the people who own the blogs are, are focused on air travel, so you're, you're speaking to the choir. Um, and uh, you take part in these blogs, and you get known for your subject with the uh, readers of that blog, and you've got a lot of material that you can steal from your own book, uh, which has already been researched and thought about and uh, distilled down and written and proofed. Uh, You can just do a copy-paste and and put some paragraphs in uh, your blog posts. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mm -hmm. these people uh, get to know you. They love you because uh, you go on. You're a celebrity. You're the author of the book. You're an important person. So it just, to me, it's a lot of fun, and I spend uh, many, many hours every day uh, on the computer um, uh, doing research and uh, corresponding with people. So research is critical for all authors, um, and, and they need to stay up to date. Uh, whether for blogs, they can anything you said, you can find anything. If if you're just if you're just stuck. For heaven's sakes, go to either MSN.com and just let it slide through, and you'll see something goofy that might trigger you uh, right. and get going. So it's your best friend. All right, Dan, let's get into a couple of things um, that we can give to people who are listening in, because you really talked about the natural stock, the cheap paper yes. uh, that the that the traditional houses are now using today. So some of the things, because you and I have sat on critiques with groups, and we're always amazed, the wrong paper, the wrong sizes, the wrong shapes, the, it's just a lot so wrong, wrong. Um, and you and I both share the, the pedigree that we used to 
be so encouraging with people that we were just glad to see them out there riding. But inside, we're saying to ourselves, oh, my God, what were they thinking? This cover is absolutely the worst thing in the world I've ever seen. And, and, and now we actually will say that to them, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think, I think it's very important that people respect the format of a, of a book. And whenever I'm writing on a new subject, I will go into Amazon and I will get every book on the subject. And it could be 5, 10, 15, 20 books. But whenever you get these books, buy them used because they're usually about a dollar plus three ninety nine for shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason to pay full price. You're, you're not going to display these books. You just want to see what they look like and, and uh, read the important parts and, and absorb that information. Um, and what you're going to find is that the, uh, each category of book has a different size, shape, and so on. And you need to respect the category. Yours has to look like the other books, the same size, the same shape, uh, and whatnot. Um, you don't want to be clever about it. Now, I've got one book I did in 1978 called The Frisbee Player's Handbook that is circular, and it comes packaged inside a 119 Frisbee disc. Uh, that's pretty unusual. I don't suggest that you do that first off. For us, it was terribly, terribly uh, popular. It sold very, very well because it really got your attention. But I had a lot of books under my belt by that time. Uh, initially, you want to respect the category and learn from that. Uh, and then, and, and, you know, always buy your books from Amazon used. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually they're in very good shape. Well, I usually buy the good to excellent uh, copies. Me anyway. too. Yeah, I'll uh, do that too. And, uh, it, and, you know, it's very inexpensive. And that's a good way to uh, uh, get any reference books that you're looking for too. So um, uh, that's just very important to respect the category and make sure that your book fits and looks like it belongs on that shelf. And that's critical. So, I mean, one of the things is, and also this is the, the, the type of paper, we've got one more minute before our break here, but that when should you use a white paper and when should you use a natural color paper? Well, I don't like what's called natural stock. I'd go up a grade on yes. that. But that, yes. that would be for fiction. Uh, paper used to be regional. It used to be that different parts of the country had different color books. And uh, that's not true anymore. It's, it's all the same. But uh, usually it's, um, say, um, off-white uh, mm -hmm. for fiction, but white should be, excuse me, fiction should be white. Now, fiction used to be 88% uh, brightness because that's what the photocopier paper okay. was. All right, hold on to that because we're going to need okay. to come back to that and reset it up for fiction and nonfiction. With me is Dan Pointer. Kyle. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Since 1987, Color House Graphics has set the standard for quality book production. Whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run, depend on Color House to help you. You'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives. If you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing with Judith Bryles, we will provide you with discount on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll-free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972. They believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. 
Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing question. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with me is Dan Pointer, who has written a gazillion books. He'll be at the authoru.org extravaganza coming up here in just uh, four weeks in Denver, Colorado, and it won't be snowing. I'll gonna gear. I'm. I'll guarantee that it won't be snow. It'll be beautiful. It's always beautiful in May here. But um, Dan is certainly the master, the guru of the self-publishing movement and market, and knows it inside and out. And I asked him a question about kind of if you're going to have a print book, what kind of paper should you be looking at, as well as is there a coloring tone for. Uh, fiction versus nonfiction. So, Dan, which way do we go? Well, for fiction, you want to use, uh, say, an off-white. Uh, but for nonfiction, it should be very white. And you look at good nonfiction books, and you'll see that they have very white paper uh, or they just don't look credible. Now, paper used to be 88% brightness because that's what the photocopy paper was. Then the photocopy machines went from black and white to color, and, uh, boy, the paper just wasn't white enough. So it went up to uh, 92 uh. 94 brightness um, and um, on my last run of the self-publishing manual uh, I paid another couple of pennies and got 96 brightness so it's just super super white and uh, it makes your nonfiction look more credible so uh, make sure you keep control of this uh, printing quality and uh, insist on very very white paper all right, and then um, are you? I'll, I'll tell you what we're getting from the feedback, at least, especially if you're going to go into a store that you only do uh, basically six by nine books um, at this point if they are hardcover fiction um, or they're you're moving into the nonfiction hardcover. But otherwise, they're moving to a more five and a half by eight and a half size, even down to five by eight. Are, are you finding that? Well, I learned that lesson years ago because I started off as a very small publishing company. I did everything myself. I mean, from writing the books to packaging them to sweeping the floor. And uh, if you get into too many sizes of books, then you have to have too many shipping cartons, and it makes them hard to pack because they overhang the other books. And, uh, boy, it gets old really quick. So my suggestion is that for soft cover you do five and a half, eight and a half, or you do eight and a half by eleven, exactly twice the size. They'll stack very nicely. Yes, the uh, you can use the same interior on your hardcover books, but of course the hardcover overhangs a little bit, so that's six by nine, as you mentioned. Yep. Uh, and don't don't. Uh, well, you know, you make it into cookbooks that tend to be wider than they are tall, so they'll open and lie flat. Um, you know, children's books can be a little different, uh, but try try to stay with some kind of standard and make all your books as, as close to each other as possible. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. All right, Dan, you are a huge, huge, huge proponent of the non-traditional markets. So let's get into, let's describe what a non-traditional market looks like and feels like and what's going on that maybe has, is, there's evolutions in it, I think, um, as we ongoing, an ongoing basis, as we started off earlier, is I, I think that the, the whole 
non-traditional market, which is where you and I probably fit in, the self-publishing market, the independent publishing, we are kind of um, spooking them a little bit. Well, I started off with books on parachutes, skydiving and technical books on parachutes, and I wrote the first book on hang gliding. It sold so well, I moved back to California and bought this house on a hill overlooking the ocean. It was on 495, if you can believe that. Uh, but I sold an awful lot of them. And um, uh, I, I was, uh, I guess, naive. I just didn't even understand bookstores. Uh, and I just figured it would be better to sell parachute books in parachute stores, parachute catalogs, uh, parachute schools, parachute clubs, and so on. And so initially, back in the early, um, I guess around 1970, uh, I actually had an addressograph machine, great big cast iron machine, and these addressograph plates. And I would uh, get all of the parachute dealers on these plates, and I would do mailings about once a month, offering books. And then uh, I, I, a couple of years later, I graduated to the addressograph uh, IBM cards, and it was a much smaller machine, and it was a lot easier to do, and you could make the cards on uh, uh, typewriter. And it was a scriptomatic machine. Well, today we have computers, and it's very easy to sort and keep it. I keep um, lengthy lists. Uh, some of my lengthy lists are kept in uh, Microsoft Excel, and um, I do my m large mailings with uh, Mad Mimi, which is like, uh, well, any one of these mailing companies, but the Mad Mimi happens to be a better deal. And uh, so we use that to send out our newsletter and, um, and our other announcements. And so on, but we're going directly to the uh, hang gliding or parachutes stores, schools, and so on. Uh, these are the people who buy by the carton. They usually buy 200 to 500 at a time, sometimes more. They've never heard of returns. They think a 40% discount is terribly generous, um, and they pay in 30 days. I mean, compare that with the book industry, where you get an order for two books, six months later you're chasing them for payment. Uh, they send one of those books back with coffee stains on it, and they want a refund. And you're thinking, I did all of this book work to send stuff out, send the package out and bring it back, and uh, I'm not making any money. You're much better off dealing with the what we call the non-traditional markets. Um, it's, um, you know, again, they, they, they pay on time and, and think the discount is wonderful, and, uh, and they're your friends anyway. You know who they are, and uh, they're not going to cheat you. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I, I learned about the, the book industry about 74 or 75, and I remember I heard I heard there was a company in New York. It was the R.R. R. Bowker Company. They had something to do with publishing. They published some books. And <laughs> they published magazines, too. And I was so naive. You know, I packaged up one of my new books, and I sent it down to Publishers Weekly, and I said, here's, here's a book uh, for review, and when you're done with it, would you please send it upstairs to uh, Library Journal? Well, <laughs> you know, I didn't know they got 100 books a day, and they threw most of them out. But anyway, they sent it upstairs to Library Journal, and Library Journal reviewed the book, and my library sales shot up by 1,200. And over the years, I proved over and over again that every time I sent a review copy to Library Journal, my library sales would go up 1,200, more or less. Um, the, you know, I just didn't know much about the book trade. And I guess it was about 77, I went through uh, went to my first book fair in Los Angeles, and I walked around and I thought to myself, I must be a book publisher, because I really considered myself as part of the parachute trade or the hang gliding trade. This is very important. That's the way you want to think. And uh, as I walked around, I thought to myself, I'll bet I'm selling more books than the rest of these people, because they were still dealing with bookstores. And um, you know, this was the uh, late, late 70s, and it was only the mid-80s when the wholesalers, one of them, Publishers Group West, decided to send out sales reps, and we renamed them, not a wholesaler, but a distributor. And my sales just shot up, because they were going out to the bookstore, showing the books, and, and taking the orders. Um, and in 1995, excuse me, yeah, 1995, then we saw uh, Amazon come along. And uh, for every publisher out there, Amazon is by far their biggest dealer. Uh, and the big publishers don't know what to do about it because the Amazon's their biggest dealer, but they feel threatened by Amazon. 
the small publisher says, you just keep on feeling threatened because I'm selling books of Amazon. And Amazon makes it very, very easy. Their accounting is excellent. You can always tell what they owe you. Uh, I know. You. I know. Uh, yeah. Um, I remember years ago when um, Judy Applebaum, you know, How to Get Happily Published, and she was mm-hmm. the uh, editor for Publishers Weekly. She had to sue her publisher because they were cheating her on foreign rights. And now of all the people to cheat, somebody who wrote a book on the industry and was the editor for managing editor for Publishers Weekly, I mean, would you cheat her? No, yeah, they sure did. They cheated her. She, she had to sue them, and she won. Well, so, I had uh, see, I I had the same problem, so I know exactly uh-huh. what you're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. That that uh, getting stiffed. I actually was stiffed. I, we figured about eighty four thousand dollars before the publishing company just said, you know, too bad. And uh-huh. and a lot a lot of authors don't get that it's very difficult to figure out what in the hell you're owed. They don't get it. They absolutely don't get it, and it's it, you can't keep track. You have no idea um, when money's come in, and it, it, it's even sometimes a challenge. Bookstores are a challenge, I think, because of their ability. They're still operating on that model from the Depression. They can send everything back, um, <laughs> and and it can come back damaged, as you know, and then you're out out of luck. Right. And it, it's really an issue. So when you can direct sales like what you did and go into it, and, and that's certainly where I came from, it was much better. Uh, the latest the stats I have now for publishing is that if you are a mid-list author, which is what most will be, um, a mid-list author, that you, your, life, your life sales, if a New York publisher picks you up, are 5,000 books. Five thousand books, and the first year is expected at around three thousand. Well, you're talking royalties, and Dan, you know, when you and I started, they paid royalties on the retail price. Right. They now pay it on net. Uh-huh. So, so with that, you're if you, if you get eighty cents a book, you're lucky. Yeah, the authors didn't even see that change, and it happened about fifteen years ago. Uh, you know, there's just no future in the brick and mortar stores. I mean, that's fine. I, you know, maybe you love the brick and mortar stores, and and that's fine. And and you know, most of them are really nice, and the people are great. But the problem is, they can't compete with online stores. Uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, when Borders went out of business, we found out what they paid in rent in Pico Rivera, California, one store. Their rent it's was thirty thirty two thousand dollars a month. I'm not talking about electricity or hiring people. I'm talking about the rent. How many books do you have to sell to pay the $32,000 just to start off? Uh, the online stores can have a warehouse out in the country. It costs them almost nothing to maintain that warehouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the future, it's obvious that the, the writing's on the wall. There's uh, no future in the brick-and-mortar stores, uh, book, whether it be bookstores or a lot of other stores. And um, by the way, um, I hope everybody has read the... Uh, book on Amazon and Jeff Bezos. It's called The Everything Store. Uh, when he started out in 1995, he wasn't going to just concentrate on books. He wants to sell everything, and he's doing that now. He's got mm-hmm. a million square foot warehouses going up all over the country. And, <laughs> and, you know, and, and delivery tomorrow. And, and I get a lot of stuff at Amazon, frankly, because I, you know, I don't have oh, to easy. shipping. Well, exactly. Um, and they make it real easy. Um, so the future is not in the uh, brick and mortar bookstores and you don't want to spend too much time pursuing them because it's just, um, well, half the time they don't pay you. I, I, th- I think that's a mistake. Um, and I, I think you're absolutely right on. And, and people who grumble about Amazon, we've got 15 seconds for our break here, but people who grumble about Amazon, you need to get over it. Amazon is a bookstore. They're just online. They do the same discounting that any distributor or wholesaler is going to do on you. So mm-hmm. you need to move on. All right, with that, we'll be right back. Dan Pointer is my guest today. This is Judith Files. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information shin, 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 right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Do you sell stuff? Do you want to sell books? Lots of them? If yes, you must take credit cards, the most widely used form of payment today. 
The free terminal has created a special program for your guide to book publishing listeners. No contract. All equipment is free. Extremely low rates and no termination fees ever. Contact Alan Dean at Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call him at 303-668-6828. The free terminal has handled all credit card transactions for both author you and Judith for over a year. Don't wait another day. Contact Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call 303-668-6828 and tell him you want the no contract author you deal. Shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd. If you want to create a book with no regrets, give her a call today, 303 885-2207. That's 303-885-2207. Or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at MyBookShepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR, perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types including side sewing we provide warehousing kitting distribution inventory management a new print on demand facility streaming browser based ebooks and bookstore call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project you can also visit our website at www.tps1.com Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, Dan and I both come, and when I say Dan, Dan Pointer, Dan and I both come from a, a both the book background as well as a speaking background, and we have sold far, far, far more books with our mouths uh-huh. <laughs> than have walked out of the store. <laughs> so um, with that, that, I think it's a good idea, Dan, to probably even address that area, that when you have a book, that even if it's an ebook, you can drive people to buy the ebook as a speaker, uh, and you can offer them little perks and goodies as well as uh, buying a card where they have a scratch off. You can do something like that. Uh, there's a variety of things that you can do. What, what's new in your world in the ebook land selling that, as well as print books with speaking? Well, this, this goes right back to uh, going where the customers are, going where the potential customers are, people who have an interest in the subject. Uh, you don't tell my. Um, you don't try to sell a skydiving book to somebody who uh, wants more information on how to raise rattlesnakes. I mean, those are completely different things. <laughs> I have books on different subjects, and I don't try to sell my Frisbee book to uh, somebody who wants to write a book. Uh, it's, it's the wrong person. It's the wrong group. So um, you, uh, when you're speaking, you're speaking on whatever subject, which is the subject of one of the books that you're pushing, 
And um, those people are already pre-selected. They're already self-appointed. They have already indicated they're interested in the subjects that you're speaking about. So if you're selling books, as we say, back of the room, uh, then they're a, a prime candidate for it. And, of course, you've got their attention for an hour, two hours, four hours, and uh, they all want to take a piece of you home. Uh, they want more information, and uh, so it's very easy to sell. It's, it's normal to, uh, to sell out the room. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and the other thing is we had it so nailed down that when we were doing our aggressive sales, and my, my record was, I think it was, it was four hours, I sold a little bit over $16,000 worth of books, nice. um, which was, which by the way, it was 563 books that went out. That and went those the people... Table. Those people, they needed your book to, to, to carry the message home, to uh, c continue with the message that you were giving. They needed your book. So it's not like you were, what, forcing a book on them that they no. didn't want uh, on how to raise rattlesnakes or something. Uh, it, you know, this is exactly what they needed, and they could uh, continue the education with the book. And, and people need to talk about it as education and, and what tools that they can take away. And I, I created a bookmark where people gave away the bookmarks. I sold my bookmarks because <laughs> I, I, I printed the, one of the key tools that I use and I teach um, on the bookmark with on the other side a tip. And I sold that as people bought a book and I said, do you want to have the key? Would you like to have um, the tool that has the key script? on this thing. Oh yeah, we need that. So that was another five dollars. And and if they wanted to buy ten of them, Dan, yeah. I had I had a rib of them, ribbon wrapped around them and I sold those for four dollars each or forty dollars. <laughs> and 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 we sold those going out the door like crazy at the healthcare groups that I was at because Directors and managers wanted them for their team. So yeah, it was the you, right group at the, you know, the right time. You had exactly what they needed. Uh, they decided that they wanted to spend money on it. It was worth it to them. Yes, but if I was there, if I was there speaking primarily on like the zapping conflict was my expertise and expertise in the healthcare workplace, that I would would I carry any of my other books with me, and I may carry a, a few copies, one or two copies. Uh, they're yeah. just to have them there because you never know there may be someone who wants that book about publishing. But if I'm at a publishing group, I'm only going to be carrying Author You and Show Me About Book Publishing and Snappy Sassy Salty. And I may carry maybe a couple of copies of my confidence book because right. people might, because it's a natural tie in. Or I may carry a couple of copies of my Stop Stabbing Yourself in the Back because sometimes we authors do do that. So well, there are people out there who cross over. I mean, I, I've given writing publishing courses, and uh, some have come up and want to buy one of my parachute books. I mean, that is pretty rare, and it's a stretch, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, but but because they know that you're parachuting oriented, so, or they have their uncle Billy is a parachutist, and they right. would love to have your book. So so think that that's a strategy um, with that. Dan, let's talk a little bit more about some of the alternative markets. And one of the things that I was saying before we went to break is there is a um, I hear pissing and moaning from a lot of authors because of the 55% discount. What they don't see with Amazon, which is fairly typical if you're selling to a distributor or a wholesaler, they're going to whack off 55%. And if they sell the book, you'll get a gross of 45% plus various costs related to sell the bloody thing, uh, which oh, could be – yeah. That's right. Yeah, I don't, um... I find it difficult to recommend a distributor, uh, certainly not a wholesaler, anymore uh, because uh, we make so little on it. Um, when you figure out your costs for printing and trucking um, and all your pre-press costs and everything else and then uh, see what you're getting back from that, most distributors take 66%. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's just as much money left. You're, you're, yeah, you're getting some quantity there. And that's helpful because printing is a quantity gain. The more you print, the lower the per unit cost. Uh, there is one advantage uh, to going to a distributor for um, Amazon, and that is if you have any problems with Amazon, yeah, good luck if you're on your own. You can't find a phone number. Uh, but if you have a distributor, they can get it solved in 24 hours. I mean, there may be something, uh, may, maybe your page disappeared at Amazon or or uh, something happened with the description and it's been mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, truncated or okay. you know, all okay. kinds of problems happen, but yes. try to get it fixed yourself. Good luck. But if you have a distributor, they're right on it, and uh, and they count because they move so much product uh, through Amazon. 
Oh, let me share a secret with all our listeners on if you have one of those things happen with Amazon, which, by the way, I had a key page disappear two weeks ago. Ah. And, and I kept going through my Advantage account saying, help, 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 help. Here is the solution. Go to the author, your author central. Everyone create an author central a, a profile with Amazon. Ah. Because when you go on the inside of Author Central and on your account, there happens to be a magic little button saying, do you need to talk to someone right now? By God, uh -huh. I, I did. So I just clicked on that, and, and Dan, within 15 seconds, my phone was ringing. Super, super. Well, that's right. great. So, so now we've discovered we don't need a distributor and we can get more money. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> hey, hey, that's a hallelujah. <laughs> yes. All right, Dan, what are some of the other trends that you see coming along here that you're going to cover at the extravaganza? Uh, well, one of the things that, uh, that I've been doing, and a lot of people are catching on to this, is uh, in their research, uh, they add uh, URLs right into the text of their books so that people who want more information can click on that and they can get the background on it. Uh, otherwise, your book would be 900 pages. And... Uh, you can stick right to your message, but you can put those references in. And it's kind of like footnotes that we used to put in books or, or lists of uh, more reading that we used to put at the end of the chapters. But let's face it, most people are reading uh, the, your book as an e-book now, and so they're reading it, and then they want uh, more background information or they want to see the list that you talk about. They can just click on that and go right to it. So uh, I see a lot more of that going on. Um, you know, I call these enhanced books, but uh, enhanced has gotten a different definition now. And um, uh, I guess uh, what, no, enhanced is, um, uh, what do you call it, reader participation, whatever mm -hmm. it's called. Interactive. Interactive. Inter inter books. Interactive. And I think yes. enhanced should be the ones that have the references and that interactive should be where the reader can, well, interact with it and take off in a different direction. I think right. those are two right. different things. I think you're correct. So one of the strategies you could do if you have a print book, you could put, although I know a lot of people are putting a lot of QR codes and stuff, and I don't think that really caught on. Um, I, I had people who used them to refer them back to their website or other areas, and they just, they just didn't see the traffic in, in no, some of their no. top-selling business books. But you could I use a QR code. Uh, yeah. that's, a mis that's a misuse of, of QR codes. It's, that's not what it was designed for. And it's, uh, I remember years ago, people warned against putting your ISBN on your back cover. You don't want to uh, distract the buyer. You don't want them to look at your ISBN or your QR code saying, oh, I think I'll go to the website and see if there's a deal or something. Uh, you want them to uh, make an impulse purchase and buy the book. You can put your uh, website, of course, on the inside somewhere. And, um, and some people have added more information and put QR codes in the book, and that's that's fine. That looks like it's, it's going to be a more valuable book because you're adding uh, more information to a QR code. But I would definitely never put one on the back cover, and I wouldn't put my ISBN on the back cover. Well, wait a minute. On a book, we need an ISBN. What's that? Yeah, on your book cover, you need an ISBN on the back cover. In the barcode? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Down there yeah, with, yeah, yeah. Down there, the price block. Yes, of course. Yes, uh, but you don't invite people. I mean, that, that's you know, that's just one of the elements on the back cover. You're not inviting people to go to your website, and uh, the way most of the ISBNs are done on the back cover, uh, people can't read them anyway. It, it, those of us who've been around, we look for okay, you know, so where's person, that price of that book? <laughs> well, All right. not only that, but you you would take a look at the uh, extension there and to see whether this is a small publisher or a large publisher. Do they have a, a, you know, a two-character identifier or a three or four or five or six? And you could tell the size of the publisher. Exactly. But most people don't know that. And you know what? It doesn't matter. All right. No. So we just have a few seconds to leave. Thank you so, so much, Dan. And we look forward to having you. Can you give me like 10 seconds why they should go to the extravaganza? I'm sorry. Ask me that again. Well, you know what? Don't have enough time. Just come okay. to the extravaganza. I will see you soon. Uh, yes, Dan Pointer will be there. Go to authoryou.org. Click on events, the extravaganza. We'll see you in four weeks. Thank you for being 
a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Each week.